Hi and welcome. I am Nikki King and I am Head of Corporate Partnerships at Women in Banking and Finance. Uh, so I joined WIBIF about 18 months ago, February last year, um, not actually as a volunteer, but as their first employee. Um, so for those of you I'm sure know, WIBIF has been around for at least over 40 years and is a volunteer-led uh, network organisation. Um, and uh, our current CEO, Anna Lane, her focus and her strategy is around growth. Uh, growth in terms of our individual members, but also our corporate partners. Uh, and she felt that in order to do this growth, it needed to be somebody's day job. So hence, I am here. Um, when I joined, uh, as I say, about 18 months ago, we had about 37 corporate partners. We now have 80, uh, which is fantastic. And it's still growing. Uh, I was on a call this morning with a potential corporate partner who are keen to join. Um, we have a really rich, diverse group of partners now, not just banking license. We have consultancy, law, recruitment, investment managers, wealth managers, uh, and tech as well. And the TIX is obviously one of our key partners too. Um, so with that, I'm very delighted to have a fantastic panel here. Um, and I'd like to uh, let them introduce themselves and just uh, talk a little bit about how you're working, where you're working in terms of that flexibility piece. Okay, well, I'm very pleased to be here. I'm Jenny Seagal. I'm thrilled as being author, which means little bit strange. I have been in the city for 33 years and I'm actually and I've been in various different sales roles and leadership roles and I now have a portfolio for oh, okay. Is it off? Wait, use it, use this, okay. I don't know how much of that I heard you heard, you heard but I'm I've been in the city for 33 years. So I'm an actuary and I've led sales teams in asset management organisations, but I now have a portfolio career. And what that looks like is I have a one day a week role as chief investment officer for Nesta. I'm building up slow, much slower than I'd like a portfolio of non-executive directorships. And I spend a big chunk of my time doing what I call speaking with images, which is a speaking business that's, that's really looking to improve workplace culture and as part of that, I've this is where the author bit comes in. I've written two books that have been published, and the third one, which I finished two nights ago, the set, and they're all on motivation and workplace culture in various different shapes and guises. The second one, which is the one of relevance today, is called Purpose and Hybrid Working. Thanks, Jenny. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Dominique Moss, and I have been a headhunter in the city for over 20 years. Um, I used to work for one of the international firms. I ran a fixed income practice, so placing salespeople and traders in banks. And then seven years ago, I set up a business called The Return Hub, which is essentially um, a unique search business, really, working with uh, companies in the financial services sector who want to um, recruit more women at the mid and senior level and a candidate population that's very often off the radar of those very traditional hiring methods um, to include returners and career pivoters. Um, I work very flexibly. I work full time, um, but I have, uh, we, we actually, when I set the business up, we used to work five days a week in, in an office in Lombard Street, one of the Regis offices, where I think many, many small recruitment businesses started their life. Um, and to some extent, I do miss that. But actually, since the pandemic, when we went fully remote, we're now hybrid. So we have an office in the city and we sort of use that as a base to come and go. And I probably do about two days in the office and the rest from home. Hi, I'm Charlene Sago. I am at the Texas Investment Managers as head of de and i I've been with the firm for about 15 years. I spent the first part of my career in broadcast media and then moved into financial services about 17, 18 years ago. And at Netixes, I've had two careers, one in marketing, uh, more recently digital marketing, over the last three years, de and i And my flex, not flex working, more like hybrid, hybrid working is two to three days a week. Hi everybody, I'm Julianne Miles. I'm CEO and co-founder of an organisation called Women Returners. Um, I have stepped in at the last moment for this. You may have seen it, it was meant to be uh, one of my colleagues, Hazel, was speaking today. Um, but yes, I am a, a, another face instead. Um, I co-founded Women Returners 10 years ago, very much driven by a mission, a mission to remove what we call the career break penalty, to normalise career breaks um, and to remove any stigma involved. Um, we work with individuals, we work with organisations, we work with the government. Um, 
we, uh, you know, primarily are um, a aiming to work with sort of commercial goals as well as social goals. So this is flexible working is an important part of the conversation um, and I think is, is a way to facilitate getting more returners in, which we'll be picking up today. Personally, um, I set up the organisation to be fully remote. Uh, I, you know, just thought that maybe there might be some pandemic on the way. Uh, so it was actually very easy for us to, to switch across. Um, we, uh, I, I now also work compressed work hours. So I work Tuesday to Friday um, uh, from home. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, and on that note, yes, in terms of my working as well, um, I work from home. Wibif doesn't actually have an office. Uh, all the volunteers have their own uh, offices that they that they work in. Um, and I do four days a week. Um, and it's fantastic. It just gives me that flexibility to be there for my children in terms of pickups and so on. Um, but actually, I feel very privileged to be working for Wibif, uh, and it has definitely been helped by the likes of Julian and Dominique. Um, <laughs> to put a little bit of context, uh, going back about 15 years ago, I was working in the payments industry. I was working for American Express, uh, and I decided to take a career break. My family and I went off to Spain um, and had a, a great experience out there. And we had about two and a half years out in Spain. And when I came back to England, I knew I needed to, to come back into the work environment. Um, but I didn't quite know what I was going to do. And a wonderful neighbor and friend introduced me to Domini. Um, and when I spoke to Domini, I remember you saying, have you thought about a returnship program? And I said, I have absolutely no idea what that is, um, but I'm really interested. Um, and uh, I went away and had a look and then managed to secure a place on MasterCard's first returnship program back in 2017. Um, and it was just a brilliant way back into the work environment. Um, we were supported, and actually the program was managed by women returners, so thank you, Julianne, as well. Um, and we were very much kind of coached through coming back into work, um, given kind of buddies. We were had lunch and learns with senior females in terms of uh, senior um, employees uh, at, at MasterCard. Um, and through that, I secured a permanent role working for them. Um, but it, it became a kind of passion of mine. And I think everybody, every company should be doing returnship programs. Uh, and I became quite an advocate of that and women and their careers. Um, and actually, when I saw this role, again, kind of posted uh, through Domini's uh, return hub, um, this was perfect. I said, this is exactly what I'm looking for. It's got my skill sets, but it's also got my passion around supporting women and, and their careers. So, uh, moving on, we don't want to hear about <laughs> my career, but um, we are discussing today uh, developing and managing hybrid inclusion in an evolving environment. Um, so, we'll kick off. And I'm going to click onto the, some stats. There we go. Many people believe that the pandemic provided a turning point for the working world. Shifting views among employers and employees alike around whether presenteeism was crucial. Did the pandemic indeed provide a watershed moment for all employer, employers to embrace flexible working and hybrid teams? So hybrid risk work risks potentially a two-tier system. It could easily become the case that office workers are top of mind for exciting projects or promotions, while those who work remotely at least some of the time, are easily forgotten. Given that working families, people with caring responsibilities, and people with disabilities are more likely to benefit from working from home, how do we make sure this two-tier system doesn't come into place? So my first question, Jenny and Dominique. What does presenteeism mean nowadays, and are the views among employers rolling back to the pre-pandemic norm that presenteeism is crucial? And how do we ensure managers resist that two-tier system? Well, I think the, present, the meaning of presenteeism has changed, I think. I, if I just go back a little bit and think about some of the, just a, a story that, that sprang to mind for me was receiving an email from my boss years ago saying everybody has to be in at eight o'clock in the morning. No, no rhyme or reason. It was just that's the way it had to be. 
And I just turned around and said, no, I'm not doing it. And my team's not doing it. It was completely ridiculous to, to my mind, the idea that it wasn't as if we were trading with Asia. It wasn't as if our clients were in that time. It was just this sort of blanket, I want you to be in because of my ego. And I said no and and um, didn't last in that job too long. <laughs> but I think, I think the, the brilliant thing about the pandemic, and obviously there were lots of things that were terrible about it from a personal, personal suffering point of view and from an economic point of view, but the brilliant thing about the pandemic is it, it, it made people like my, that former boss realize that working and being present in the office are not the same thing. And that, that, that just because you're sat at your desk or clicking your mouse doesn't mean you're working, you know, and, 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 and sort of breaking, breaking through that. So there's a realisation, which I think is really, really helpful. The trouble, though, now is, it, as you say, people, you know, we're, we're all really clever people and we game things. I was at a talk a couple of weeks ago about people in Lloyd's Market and that people are working, coming into the office four days a week. That was the, the rhythm that they'd, they'd fixed. And you could come in on the fifth day, but most people didn't. Apart from the young lads who worked out that was the one day he could get guaranteed FaceTime every Friday by having lunch with the CEO. And so that's what he did. And you tell me that's not a career advantage. Of course, it has to be a career advantage. And I, I, think, I think this is, I think awareness of presenteeism is really important. Awareness of proximity bias is part of the challenge because we all have it. And I, I think that we can do things, we can put things in place to try and minimize it, but I think it's a thing. And pretending it's not isn't helpful. I think, but trying to recognize it, because clearly we're people and we like people and you like people that you spend time with. That's how we develop personal relationships. And you tell me that in 10 years time, the kid who's coming in on a Friday isn't is having lunch with the CEO, isn't gonna have a career advantage over those who aren't. I just, I just, it's a fact of life. So I think that's um, I think that's an, that is it is it is an issue. Um, shall I stop stop there? Let's okay. <laughs> well, I agree with pretty much everything you said, Jenny. But um, so I think you know definitely the pandemic was obviously a watershed moment for companies to embrace. Well, at the, the time it was obviously fully remote for a lot of people, bar those who had to be in, um, you know, traders and and people that the regulator required to be in. Um, I think it really did obviously show employers what they, what could be done because previously I think talking to clients about whether they could embrace a hybrid or flexible working role it was always no no it's too difficult you know we've got the technology don't have the technology for it yet when the pandemic came in and lockdown happened companies literally had to turn on a sixpence and within you know two weeks practically people had moved offices fully remote and pretty much it worked um, which always sort of strikes me as a bit of an interesting example is what you know what you can achieve when you have to achieve it um you know mountains can be moved um i think in terms of presenteeism there's obviously a bit of a divide between what some organizations are saying versus others um you know perhaps the neighbor simplification but broadly obviously more american organizations are saying let's get back at, uh, let's get everyone back full time europeans less so and, and obviously uk organizations less so but um i think in terms of you know, presenteeism really is about what are you doing when you are present in the office versus just being in the office and being very aware that, you know, you, you have an opportunity then to make sure that your communication is a kind of laser focus about what you want to achieve when you're in the office. Because as someone um, senior, who I think might be in the room, said to me earlier today, um, you know, I don't want people in the office being on Teams calls all day because what's the point of that? Um, so I think, you know, really important to think, what are you doing whilst you're there and who are you connecting with and who are you building relationships with, increasing your network and making sure that people know what you're doing. So, of course, if you're working from home, it can be difficult for people to know what you're doing. And it is a total myth that the workplace is a meritocracy where if you just put your head down and do a good job, you'll get promoted. Um, you know, we, we all know that that's only, you know, doing a, bare, doing a good job is the bare minimum. The rest is all about building a network and, you know, pushing yourself forward and making sure that people know what you're doing. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I have to admit, it reminds me, I, I never forget a moment when I was working at American Express so a number of years ago now. And it was a Friday morning. Uh, the office was probably about half full. Um, and this was obviously before kind of the hybrid and, and flexibility working. And a senior female lady coming out of her office, storming out of the office, literally furious that half the office were not there. And she was, where is everybody? <laughs> you know, what are they doing? She thought they were essentially were bunking off and having a day off because they weren't physically in the office. Um, and it was a bit of a realization that then, you know, gosh, if you weren't in the office, you were clearly thought of not working very hard. So um, 
But anyway, uh, so following on from that, that hybrid kind of discussion, Charlene and, and Julian, what are the issues that employers face when managing people in a hybrid team? Uh, and what can, you do, what can they do to nurture and develop an inclusive environment? I think there's a couple of things here um, for me. I think the first one is you clearly have to manage differently, right? I think that you've got to be very intentional about the time that you spend in the office. So, for example, you know, for meetings that I host, I try to make sure they're not on the days I'm in the office, which is typically Tuesdays to Thursdays. Because to your point, why do you want to be on teams in the office? And I actually think that having the discipline not to have many meetings whilst you're in the office, it's not just with your team, by the way, it's having the opportunity to speak to others within the business, really important. So I just think there's a, there's a real intention that needs to come from managers. And I know that we can't always control everything, right? But there's a lot that we can control. Um, so I'd say absolutely that. And also, you know, you come into the office for the human connection, um, make the time to understand where people are at mentally, you know, um, in their lives outside of work when they're working from home. Um, so I think there's, a, there's an effort that each and every one of us can do every day. And I think also on the second piece, um, you know, how do you, you make sure people are inclusive? I think you've got to really work on strategic visibility. So for me, what that means is as a manager or leader, think about what you're doing that promotes the work that your teams are doing. Because to your point, that proximity bias, right? If you're not seen, you're not heard. What are you doing to make sure that the work that your team's doing, the business is aware? And there are plenty of farms and businesses, right? You all have business updates. You have town halls. You don't need to be that person presenting and updating the business on what your teams are doing. Let them do it, okay? I think that's really important. And I think also, you know, you probably need to proactively start looking at stretch projects for your team members that allows them to collaborate with other parts of the business functions and teams. Again, back to that strategic visibility. So all of those things, again, have to be intentional. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely agree important to recognize it, it's not easy for a line manager to manage particularly not easy when often the rules that come down from on high change uh, and maybe you have hired people with certain promises about how they can work they've set up their lives their way then things change and you're having to manage that it's also a huge learning curve i mean before the pandemic most of the majority of, of line managers had not managed people even remotely. And, and now things have changed. And it, it's still, you know, we had this enforced period where there was no option. And now it's trying to evolve a way that works, a way that works for the individuals and a way that works for the business. Um, so I think that's where we are at the moment. I think there's huge potential. I mean, I think it's, you know, the whole notion of hybrid working has brought so many more people back into the workforce um, and has made it so much more doable, but there are unintended consequences. And I know that's one of the things that we flagged as a topic here. Um, and I was particularly struck, there was some, some research that uh, Deloitte did of women in work, and they did it in 2022 and 2023. Um, and they asked women who were working on a hybrid basis about, do you feel excluded? You know, are you excluded? Do you feel excluded from decision making? Do you feel excluded from maybe those informal conversations? Um, and 37% of women in 23 said that they did. Now, the good news is it, it had gone down from 60% in 2022. So I think there is some learning. Um, and I think there has been an understanding that some of those things that were fine it was get, might have been you know going for a drink at lunch you know going for a drink after work or having informal conversations or maybe scheduling meetings at certain times that doesn't work anymore uh, if you're working on a hybrid basis so i think there's an evolution but still 30 percent of people saying they feel excluded we've got a long way to go um and the other thing is 30 percent said that they felt they didn't have access to senior leaders and i think you know Exactly back to you, to what Jenny was saying before, you do need to be there uh, to get that access. Um, so I think we're, we're moving in the right direction. We've still got a long way to go. I think there is a need for training and there is a need to be very deliberate uh, and, and not just these sort of these rules of, oh, well, you've got to be in the office two days a week. Well, 
there needs to be real thought by the managers ab about what is happening. Can people be in at the same time? Um, we have so many stories, actually, of returners in our network. They've gone into the office and they're hot desking and they're sitting there and they're like, well, I've got nobody to talk to anyway and I'm still on my Teams calls. Um, or they're sitting at home on their remote working day and there's other people in the office and they're talking and you're, you're on Teams and you can't quite hear what's going on. So a lot of those micro details are things that need to be worked through and I think they if a manager is working on those and if they talk about it and have that communication actually that's what starts to make the difference thank you yeah um, and he's like we popped up some some research stats I don't know if everyone can kind of read them but from the hybrid work commission in 2023 but 75% of hybrid workers believe that hybrid working has had a positive impact uh, you know, on their work-life balance. 69% um, of those with children under 18 reported that hybrid work had made juggling their parenting responsibilities easier. Um, so, and I know, Dominique, at the Return Hub, you've done some research in kind of future flexible, and Jenny, with your book as well. Um, and we know that various surveys have shown that employees would like to work more remotely than their employees allow. Um, but having said that, I think in 2022, only just under 38% of managers reported that that organization actually even conducted a, a survey uh, with the employees to work out their working preferences. So the question is, do you see that employers and employees diverge in their approach to hybrid and remote work? And how do you think this will play out? I can do it. Okay, so if I, this this is the key question that I addressed in my book. I interviewed about 45 odd people, odd people, 45, roughly 45 people at the, the end of last year and the start of this year to ask them that question. And you know, the punchline was that employers want people to be in the office for more days and employees want to be in for. And then I think the interesting thing is to lift the lid up on that and, and understand the why. So when I asked employers why, there were some really good reasons why they want them in. It's things like collaboration and mentorship and team building and culture and all those really good reasons. And there were some really bad reasons as well. There were things like lack of trust and an ego and status. And I've I've paid for the office space, so I want people to come in and use it. You know, those those kind of reasons. And if I was talking to a really very senior guy from a huge organisation that I met really recently and he said he I tell you he knew that I'd been writing this book on hybrid and his point of view was well um I don't believe in hybrid working because how do you know they're working and I said yeah okay but you're conflating two issues here one is have you got people who are good workers and the other one is where are they working and they're totally different just because someone's in the office doesn't mean they're a good worker you know so there's there's, there's that kind of confusion in people's brains and then you ask the employees why they want to stay at home. So the flip side of that, the employees understand your why. And again, there are some really good reasons why people want to work more days at home. And they are you know, principally work-life balance, those kind of things. People have said that you know, they, they can concentrate better on their job when they're, when they're at, at home. But there were some less good reasons as well. There were some people who weren't working as hard who were, who were shirking. There was fearfulness as well. People had forgotten the good sides about coming to the office. They've forgotten that actually what makes us happy as humans is people and team. And in our, we've become quite hermitical during COVID and we've forgotten that. And there's lots of research done about the value of workplace best friends. And if you have a best friend at work, your satisfaction levels go up, you work hard, you stay, you, 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 you stay longer with the organisation and people have forgotten that they actually get a lot of pleasure from coming into the office. One person I interviewed said her mother can always tell from the tone of her voice whether she's, that she's been in the office because she just sounds lifted. She sounds so much more engaged and happier. But the reason that I really push back on is when people said to me, I'm more efficient when I work from home. And the reason I push back on that is because for most people, they've forgotten that their job is not their to-do list. Their job is to ensure the success of their business. And part of that, yes, is their to-do list, but part of it is not. And yes, they might individually be able to work through their 10 items on their to-do list with 100% effectiveness when they're at home. And that might drop to 70% effectiveness when they're in the office. But the very act of them being in the office 
raises everybody else's effectiveness. So net net, the office wins. And if I think about people as kind of you know, with different brains interacting and you can imagine neural pathways, neural sparks that form when you have people together, the random stuff, you know, these these um, these serendipitous interactions that happen when you get people together, the unknown unknowns, they're all those positive benefits and people become very siloed when they're working from home and that's, that you lose that innovation. Short term, yes, you'll be more, you'll get your to-do list done, but you'll lose the the unexpected innovation that comes when you get people together. Thanks, Jenny. Um, yeah, I think as in most things in life, you know, some sort of balance is where you want to be. And um, in, in just an answer to the, the bit about how does this play out, um, I think there's a few things here. Um, I was actually ha had a had a coffee this morning with a, the former global head of recruitment at one of the big UK banks, and uh, asking this question. And he said, um, prior to our hybrid working um model if you like um oh no he said sorry if i'm gonna get it right now he said basically we doubled the, the pool of candidates that we have access to th through having a hybrid working environment which is amazing i mean that is absolutely game-changing and um another piece of research actually i'm not going to look at my notes to get this right but there was an opinion poll done by public first who said that the proportion of women working full-time uh, because of hybrid work has gone from 75 percent to 83 percent so you know, surely it's got to be a good thing for employers to have access to a wider uh, talent pool, particularly where, you know, that intersects with diversity and organizations are really understanding the benefit of that and why do we want diversity and, you know, it's better for the bottom line, it's better for governance, group thinking benefits from diverse opinions. So the wider the talent pool that you have access to, the easier, in inverted commas, because none of it's easy, uh, to build a diverse um, a diverse team. So I think those organizations that are going to stick to that hybrid, we, we can offer a hybrid working environment, is are going to benefit from that. We already see that, you know, I mentioned earlier about a lot of the American organizations being much more focused on getting everyone back to work. And we've certainly seen lots of CVs for, you know, not just women, but people from those organizations who are thinking, you know, either A, you know, that's just now not going to suit my setup at home, my life, if I have to be back in the office five days a week. A lot of people moved house during the pandemic. I was one of them. Uh, you know, and filling that, f finding a way to fit that back into a kind of five days in London in the office role is just feels like it's a stretch too far. So if there is an opportunity to go and work for an employer where they have got a hybrid, you know, very good attitude towards hybrid working, then that gives you an advantage as an employer, particularly if you're an employer that isn't competing for talent on the terms of pay, um, you know, this is a really, really significant, um, uh, you know, opportunity to have access to a pool of people through the offering of hybrid working that you may not otherwise have access to. And we've, we've, we've absolutely seen that. Um, you know, the, the flip side of that is, and, and Jenny, agreeing, agreeing with you, I think, on how this plays out for, for, for people, for employees, is, um, is, is that is that it goes back to that balance, isn't it? Again, it goes, if you're fully remote, you've got to have to work really, and you want to kind of, you know, climb the ladder, you've got to be thinking, there's got to be absolute crystal clear communication on what your objectives are and what you need to do to get to those levels and that brilliant communication between managers and, and teams if, if, if you are fully remote. You've got to really, to your point, is to think, be intentional about those interactions. Um, and, you know, there's obviously numerous stories, well, I can think of a few stories of people who've, you know, you might have two people who are up for promotion in a job. One of them is in, when they're in, they're being very proactive and intentional about going to see their mentor, being in the being in front of the hiring managers, the senior people, lunch, who was it saying lunch with the CEO on a Friday. You know, those things. When the time comes to just say between these two people, who are we going to get promoted? Well, we kind of, we know this person here who's been knocking on the door all the time and saying, I want this and can I have that? And can I meet this person and be introduced to that person? Versus the other person who may be struggling to have their voice heard to the same extent through working from home um anyway those are those are my thoughts <laughs> i could go on but <laughs> thank you yeah and I, and I think it slightly depends on where people are in their stages of their career as well um so you might want you know something different you're just starting out on your career you probably want to be in the office a bit more you want to get to know people and network and find out how the company works whereas if you've been working for a company for maybe 10 15 20 years you probably don't feel the necessity so much maybe to to have to do that and and can work from home a bit better but sort of on that piece um in terms of you know different stages and affecting time in the office uh, hours and how people want to work 
what more needs to be done by employers to ensure employees are supported all the way through stages of their career? Um, so Jenny, well, Charlene, I think. I think this is a great question. I think the first thing I'll do is start with my own personal experience. So having joined the Texas in 2008 as a contractor on a fixed term contract, I became permanent in 2010. One of the first things I did was ask to work flexibly. And at the time it was, I wanted to take my kids to school in the morning and I wanted to have Fridays at home working. Nobody did that in the firm in London. And it was like, well, you know, you know, can you do this? I was like, well, legally, it does say that as an employer, you have to find a really good reason for me not to do this. And as I've been with you for two years, you see that it's all about the outcomes and the productivity, right? Um, and so I was the first. And what warmed my heart greatly was after that, seeing other women come into the organization and use my example and say, well, Charlene's been able to do it. That's working really well. How about me? So I'll, I'll start with that. But I think, you know, um, the world has changed. We've all got to accept it's changed. Uh, I think we have to exercise a little bit more empathy, and I think we need to be cognizant that individuals have responsibilities. You know, let's not forget, we live, we live to work. We don't work to live. We've got individuals in our lives that need caregiving um, responsibilities. We've got uh, might have disabilities ourselves. We might have family pets, by the way that we need to look after. And so I just think that as employers and as managers, we should be you know, cognizant of that. And I think we should be a little bit pragmatic and focus on the outcomes and productivity. And people are, you know, people are so much happier when they can do those things and have that flexibility. So why would you offer it to them? Uh, I'm gonna, I think talk a little bit about returners specifically in a minute, so I won't focus on that now. But I, I do think there is this there is this arc through a career, and I think one of the things that we haven't talked about is people later in career as well, um, and actually the value of of hybrid working of increased flexibility. Um, we see people who are unretiring is actually a bit of a trend that we have seen because of cost of living crisis. People coming back in, um, and one of the things that's facilitating that is being able to work in a hybrid fashion, in a, in, in a flexible fashion. So I think it's it goes right through. Um, I, I I think it is harder, and I think there is some research saying it's, it's, it's more difficult for the people early on in their career because they're not getting the same exposure, they're not getting um, all that sort of osmosis you get when you start in your career and you're, you have people around you and you're, you're learning from them. And I think that is challenging. I think the other thing is when we give people the choice, that's when personality factors come into play as well. So if you're more naturally an extrovert, you're going to get yourself into the office more. If actually you're more naturally an introvert, you might be like, it's fine, I can stay at home, I get my job done. Um, but that's where we hit the factors, you become, you can become less visible. So I think we need to, if we give people total choice, sometimes that's not quite as helpful as we think it should be. So again on that one now, in terms of how we address this as an issue i think a lot of the problem comes down it comes down to manage management style and that we are as an industry and i'm sure we're not just the only industry that's very guilty of this whole player coach thing that people are promoted to management and they're told that they're a player coach which basically i think translates to you've got this team to manage but we're not actually going to give you any time to do it in and it's not going to be part of your KPIs. So you've somehow got to take on this additional responsibility. We're not actually going to help you in terms of giving you time to do it and reduce your own outcomes for what you're, you have to do in your to-do list. Somehow you've got to do it. So people don't have the time, the space to think and really produce an individualized plan with each individual to work out what it is will work for them and, and bringing things back to... Uh, you know, to why people get put into management positions in the first place, I think is key because people are generally promoted into positions of management as because they're being is a reward for being good technicians rather than because they've got the people skills to be good managers. And then we don't actually ask them if they want to be a manager. And if we did, they'd probably have to say yes, because otherwise they look like a naysayer and there's no other route to seniority in an organisation. So what you end up with is lots of managers who are very good technicians, but don't actually have natural people skills. We don't give them time to manage and we don't tell them what good looks like. 
And often they've been taken out of a role they were really, really good at, really comfortable at, and put into a role that they feel at sea at. So they naturally revert to type, which is to wanting to tell other people how to do the job that they're really, really good at, to micromanage. And it's very difficult for micromanagers to micromanage people remotely. So they want them back in the in the office more. So I think part of the solution is for is I mean it's not possible for all organizations, but ideally for there to be a parallel career path for people who are very to promotion, where you have a like a subject matter expert promotion path where people are as senior, as valued, as well paid as the person who happens to be managing a team, because it's a totally different skill set. And why should we assume that someone who's really, really good at writing spreadsheets or whatever happens to also have coincidentally the empath empathic skills to be a really good manager? And so I throw that challenge back to companies to think about who they're promoting to management to make sure they've got adequate time as well to manage and that you put it down in their KPIs and, you, and what gets measured gets done to, such, to a certain extent. So you put it down that... 30%, actually 50% of your time should be spent managing your team. I spoke to one, this is for the research for my first book, I was spoke to one woman who's a lawyer and she was managing a team of 20 people. I mean, who can manage a team of 20 people? And there was no concession given to, actually there was, she was allowed to drop her chargeable target from 100% of her time to 95% of her time to manage a 20 strong team of people with totally different needs. You know, some of them had young children, some of them had elderly parents, some of them, you know, you know, was battling cancer, you know, all sorts of things that life happens to people and managers have to be able to deal with that and try and really support their teams. Who can do that on 5% of your working week? It's impossible. Thank you. Um, and I just remember kind of looking back at my career. I think before I had children, I was very happy to work full time, work in the office. Uh, and then when I came back, the employer I was working for after my first maternity leave, I said, can I go four days a week? Uh, and he came back and he said, I, I can't offer that to you because I can't have one other extra head count for that one extra day. And then I'm missing a day, essentially. But he said, what I can offer you is compressed hours. So essentially, you do your five days in four and you can have a day at home, which worked really, really well, actually. And it was quite a nice way of, of and also he said, you will probably get annoyed because if you just did four days, you would probably end up working five days, but only get paid for four days. Whereas compressed hours, at least you're paid your five days, but you just put them into four days. So um, one other question. So lastly, yes, to, to Julianne. Um, in the UK, we have a significant number of people who've left the workforce during the pandemic, but probably would like to return back to work. Um, or potentially need to because of the cost of living crisis. So how can flexible options support those groups to return to the workforce? It's, it, it's made a huge difference. Um, I mean, I think it really has been a game changer. We had so many people before the pandemic who were looking for flexible working and couldn't find it, particularly at the level they wanted to go back at. Um, and I think that's that's a key thing here is often people who were looking for flexible working and it was, you know, ma mainly mothers and people with with elder care responsibilities. They were having to take the jobs way below their skills level because you weren't allowed to work flexibly at those more senior levels. Um, and I think that's changed and that that shift has made such a big difference. So we have we have 9,000 women. We run um, a network community, the Women Returners Professional Network. And we've had so many more people saying that they they are now, it's, it's changed the way they are seeing the sense of possibility um, in terms of going back to the type of role that they did before, the type of sector, um, the type of opportunity. So it's, you know, I think the, the mindset has shifted of, is it possible? And now it's not saying, as we flagged here, whether, you know, everything is ironed out in terms of is that re the reality when you get back to work? But I think it, it has, um, it, it's enabled us as a society and as the financial services sector to, to harness the talents of a lot of people where, where it was being wasted because either they were leaving the sector completely or they were coming back in at, at way too junior levels. Um, so I think we are, you know, a slow shift, uh, but definitely um, a shift that's ha happening. Um, and I, I just hope we don't regress. I think that's, I think that's the key thing. I, I think there was, you know, we've seen, I mean, we, 
we work in different sectors as well. You know, I think in, in the tech sector, there was a period post pandemic where it was like, fine, everybody can work from home. It's sort of totally flexible and remote. And there's been a shift back with lots of these organizations as well. And as you say, people have structured their lives around it and they thought, well, I can, I can get back to work. I can maybe do the school drop off or, you know, sort out medical treatment. We, we also have people coming back in who've had health related breaks and they're just feeling physically they can't get back into the office every day, but this means they can get back in, uh, you know, if they're only coming in two days a week. And now if things are changing, then their perception of can I do this job is also changing. So I, I hope we can maintain the gains that we've made um, in terms of bringing a lot of groups back in into the workforce and into the workforce at the right levels. Um, so yeah, I think it's what we all need to just just be conscious it's not as simple as saying we, we want you all to come back in because it's going to be, you know, we'll get more collaboration. That it, it needs to be thought through individual by individual as to whether it's possible. Thank you very much. I'm going to open up to any questions of the audience, please. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, so Jenny touched upon this uh, with respect to manager personality styles or management styles. So my question was, what can firms offer to managers as they struggle leading people and being people managers, which is already a difficult job in this hybrid work environment? So is there a framework, tools, training that they can help managers with so that they can become better at understanding what the challenges are with hybrid management? So I haven't seen any kind of formal training around this. I think what needs to be done really is to, I, I, I've, I've sort of come up with this idea, which I call the, call the cost value matrix. So you imagine a two by two where the horizontal is how much an employee values something rather than how much it costs. Um, and and the, the vertical is how much it costs the employer. So ideally, if you think about this two by two, then where you want to be is in the top right, where you've got things that the employee really values, but cost very little to the employer. And you want to avoid being in the bottom left of stuff that employees, it costs a lot, but employees don't value. And tongue in cheek, don't quote me on this, tongue in cheek, you've got sort of pension contributions in that bottom left, because, you know, the yeah, perceived wisdom is that particularly young people don't value the pension contributions, and obviously they're hugely expensive so i think this is quite a useful framework that a manager can use on a one by one or a one-on-one -on -one with their team clearly not if you've got a team of 20 that becomes very difficult but if you sit down with someone honestly and say okay so this is what is it that you value what is it that's important to you as an individual and it might be that they want to come into the office two days a week or it might be that they want to have a desk by the window or they want to have a job a different job title but going through that kind of a mapping exercise one-on-one -on -one helps a manager to connect with their team and perhaps the team that each individual team mem member to be valued and to have an honest discussion about what it is that, that that enables them to do their job properly and and it needs to be done in a way which where there's trust and developing trust doesn't happen straight away if there's a, if you've got a difficult relationship with your employee obviously they're not going to be upfront about what it is that matters particularly some of the stuff particularly if it's low value stuff can feel quite petty if you're asking for it but of course the irony is that if you're asking for something petty it's probably because it's free and it would be a relatively easy thing to give but i think that's quite a useful tool and a concept to give to managers and helps to get across the idea that it is very personal and what you're trying to do as well is to optimise. It's not just about, there's kind of two, two sides to it. So I was seeing what Dominique was saying about you need to, you know, people who've got dogs and people who've moved out and all that kind of thing. And that's important if you want to retain those people in the workforce. But equally, organisations have got to get the job done. And, and so it's kind of, kind of being able to strike that balance and employees, things swing and where's the power of balance? Is it with the employer or the employee? What you really want to try and do is be as individual as you can, but also make people understand that they're there to do a job and the job has to be done. And it might be that the job, 
they could that the, if they were involved in a, in a project that it's home based for the first six months you can do more at home in those six months but then the nature of the work changes and for the next three months actually it's quite important to be in the office more because you're seeing clients or whatever you know, for whatever reason and and having a kind of framework to help do that is useful one of the things i talk about in the second book is this idea of the i call it the work wheel and it's um I'm going to do like like so if you imagine a wheel and the spokes of the wheel and each of the different spokes is an aspect of your work that's important so it might be client meetings or it might be team meetings or it might be writing spreadsheets or whatever the things are and you you just you think about that wheel and then you think about what is where am I when the, in the middle of the wheel is ineffective and the rim of the wheel is brilliant at it what does it look like on each of those dimensions when I'm working 100% from home and you get like a wiggly spider chart what does it look like when I'm working 100% from the office and you get a different shape wiggly spider chart and it doesn't take a genius to work out that for you know for the ones where you're near the end those tasks you should be doing in the office back to the points about intentionality and the ones where you know so, so, so from that you can actually help to design from a position of logic what your hybrid policy should be and this is quite a powerful thing to talk about with, with your employees because it's about winning hearts and minds and dictate um dictating terms doesn't work Should, well maybe it does but say you've got is it jp morgan who is saying you've got to be in five days a week and what will happen i suspect and you might tell me that i'm wrong but i think what might happen is that people who don't want to do that will leave assuming their jobs for them to go to and jp morgan will be left with a, a less diverse workforce of people who don't care and they're quite happy to do five days a week maybe that doesn't matter but you know i think people in this room particularly with the diversity project people probably think it does matter and that's why we're passionate about about diversity so um so you know so, the, so what you so dictating terms to people doesn't really help. What does help, I think, is, is winning hearts and minds. So this work wheel tool is a tool that helps to win over minds because it, it comes from a point of logic and intentionality. And you can see actually what we need to do to achieve this job is while you're doing these bits, you need to be in the office. And actually those bits take up about 60% of your working life. So by logical extension, 60% of it, you should probably be in the office. And when you're in the office, make sure you're doing the things that are effective in the office. And that's quite a useful tool. And then the other aspect is winning the hearts. And that is, again, back to the intentionality is that when people, if it's me telling you or you telling your team, say, come into the office because you'll have serendipitous interactions, you'll make workplace friends and it'll be wonderful, it'll be done. That's all very well, but people need to experience it. And, you know, the bribes don't work. The, the free pizza and the white wine on a Thursday it was nice once, you know, but then it gets a bit, you know, it's a bit not stupid. But get it, but creating environments, a lot of businesses have been really good about this, is where, although some again have shut down offices totally and there's no, they come in and they are hot desking and they're not sitting with anybody that they know. So thinking, encouraging managers to think about an environment where people, you can win people's hearts and they'll come in and they'll have a nice time and they'll want to come in more. So those kind of tools, I don't know if that's helpful, it's not sort of formal thing, but it's it's kind of some, some ideas there about how you can empower managers to help motivate their employees so they actually want to come in and they can see the point of it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, hi, I've, I've got a question that's perhaps a little bit more on the formal end of the scale. So I'd be interested from the panel um, regarding... Um, we can't remote... quite hear you. Can you speak? Can you not hear me? It, is that better? Yeah. Okay, so it's a little bit more formal, this question. So it's regarding uh, remote contracts. Um, so have you seen, has the panel seen an increase in requests for, and indeed acceptances, uh, of remote working contracts, bearing in mind, um, I think, Dominique, you mentioned people moving away during the pandemic. Um, and off the back of that, um, has there been any impact in terms of eliminating or reducing London waiting, for example, for those colleagues who are remote? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, uh to be honest, I don't have that many data points in terms of re remote contracts. Um, I would imagine definitely <laughs> there'd be an increase. Um, I do think there are more companies, though, that are 
um, uh, putting contracts out of other locations, I know cities outside of London, and presumably that is for cost, for cost reasons. Um, so whereas, you know, like before had a role out of London, it might not be Sheffield or Leeds or wherever. And the, you know, the, the salary, the costs are less. And the rationale being that actually if it's a fully remote role or it's a, they only have to go to that place twice a week, you know, that, that's, I have definitely seen that. Is that the question? Is that the, um, is that what you were wondering? Uh, is that what you're asking? Yes, but I mean, if they're attached yeah. to a particular office, you know, and they're not going mm. to be moved to a different office. So say they live in the Shires <laughs> and they're yeah. attached to a London office. Yeah. Um, has there been a, a reduction in London waiting, for example, that they're given if they no longer ever come into a London office? <laughs> I guess it's a, it's a broad question. I just would, you know, in, in terms of the broad panel, I guess I was just interested if there are themes emerging around some of those hot topics. Not that, I, not that I've seen, but that doesn't mean to say, obviously, it's still going on. But it's just... maybe, maybe there are HR professionals in the audience that might be able to. Andrew at CIB, I'm looking at you, Andrew. <laughs> Putting me on the spot, I, th I think it's very industry specific. I think less so in financial services. I think probably there is a movement in general of roles that don't need to be in London, outside of London. And I've I've heard of roles that are fully remote, but um, I think they would certainly have a re have no London waiting to them because they can be filled from anywhere and done from anywhere. I haven't seen much of it, just just like Domini, but. Um, I think if we do see more of it, I think it will be more of a generic UK pay level than a London waiting. And I guess it, in terms of what I've seen, not really in financial services, but definitely in the tech sector, um, but the t still tends to be an attachment to an office, but actually typically the offices aren't in London. Uh, so I think that, that's interesting, but we have... Um, of the organizations we've worked with actually in the midlands and the north and they have partly because of actually local skill shortages that's been a you know a driver for them to say we need to be harnessing talent more broadly around the uk um and so they are they might be coming into the office like once a month or something like that but they could be living anywhere in the uk but i think that's uh, yeah definitely seen it more in other sectors rather than in, in financial services. I, I was just going to respond to your question, actually, but Jenny answered most of it. Um, so I, I work with TimeWise Flexible Working Consultancy. Um, so Jenny, yeah, you, you outlined most of it, but I think what we find is a lot of line managers, they're not being trained, but when they are, they still don't understand job design and how you can make individual roles flexible. Um, and that seems to be missing from a lot of the training out there. So. Just to add on to what you said, Jenny. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, lady at the back. Hi, thanks. Um, if uh, some people are allowed to work three days in the office, two days at home, and some teams in the office are still full time because they're client facing and the like, how do you, um, have you got experience of what capacity of floor space you need? Because obviously offices are trying to save money and we're trying to fit the teams in, but it's not easy because then someone will put a meeting in for a day that they're supposed to be at home. And so they're in a little bit more than they're contracted for or different days. Do you mind just just speaking to the mic and just just so repeating the question one more time? Say it's a sixty percent in the office sort of contract for everybody. What floor space do you need to be able to actually fit them in? Do you need eighty percent? Do you need ninety percent? Seventy percent? Because it's not sixty. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I'm just thinking. The problem is everybody's working Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, so you actually end up. It's not like everyone's gridded and kind of you know you can sort of map everyone to a desk. And I so I actually, I'd want, I'd actually don't know, but I can imagine it's, I mean, HSBC obviously have moved to their office famously from Canary Wharf to the city to have less office space on the basis that they are going to be running, you know, they're committed to hybrid working. So they, 
I mean, you might have to be, I might have to ask any, any architects in the room. <laughs> I don't know. But um, yeah, facilities, yeah. But um, yeah, I think it's, it's you know, often the, the whole point of hybrid working is that people are get, coming together in the office at the same time for collaboration. So you still, I can't imagine there's that much of a reduction in floor space, but that's just my. So this is, I think this is part of the problem is you ended up with, with the tail wagging the dog. You end up making bad decisions for logistical reasons. So you're you're saying actually, well, we've we've you know we've reduced the floor space. So you know we've, we we can't have a hundred people anymore in the office. We can only have sixty. So forty people you can't come in. And then when you can come in, you end up with this problem about you're not sitting with people that you actually work with. And and so businesses to some extent, I know it's it's kind of the classic taxi driver thing. I wouldn't start from here, but some businesses have have caused themselves an issue because they've cut down floor space and they can't accommodate who they need to have in at any one time to ensure that they can get the collaboration that they need. And and so I think it's, I mean, I had, I, I'm not being very helpful because I'm not giving a solution, but I'm, I guess I'm pointing to there is a, there's, I think I see that I see a problem with this. And yeah, you do want days when you've got everybody in. I was, I was talking to one organisation, trying to remember who it was, and they were trying to, I'm oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, that's much better, isn't it? Um, the, I, I was talking to one organisation and they had decided they were going to have finance and HR in on different days. Everybody, the other thing is that people generally hate hot desking. Everyone likes to have their own desk and you come in and, you know, you sit next to Joe and you sit next to Peter and and, and that's just our, how our brains map and you want to sit near, the, you want to know who's in. And so everybody still in this setup, they still have their own desk. It's just on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, it's Paul's desk. And on Thursday, Friday, it's it's Alison's desk. And they, they've tried to design functions where having silos like that so that paths never cross is not going to be too much of an issue. And they, they figured that HR and finance never actually had to meet. <laughs> I don't know if that, but, but, and again, the, there is always a compromise with that. Life's a compromise, I've come to the conclusion. And, and so you, you don't know what you don't know. You don't know what brilliant ideas you will be missing with HR and finance never in at the same time. Maybe none, but maybe something awesome. We just don't know. Thank you. Any more? Oh, gosh. Okay, two more. Let's do two more, and then we'll probably have to wrap up. Mine's, mine's really quick, hopefully. Um, I was just wondering, I guess the, the job market is turning, and so are you seeing employers seeing that they are able to drop the option um, of hybrid working now that, you know, essentially people are looking for higher wages? Is that an option that employers feel that they can let go um, to therefore attract more people who are happy to work on a full-time basis? Um, yeah, well, I think that is um, the weight. I think Jenny was saying earlier, the pendulum is swinging in favour of the employer. You know, pre just after the pandemic, it was boom time. You know, companies couldn't be hiring quick enough. And, um, you know, obviously candidates were able to, you know, to some extent set their terms. Um, that has definitely changed. And so it's, you know, it's a, it's a two, it's two sided, right? Because for some employers where they're not competing on things like pay, they will still offer and be committed to hybrid working. So, you know, it's an opportunity to kind of widen the talent pool. And, you know, presumably employers want the widest choice of candidates from which to choose from. Um, but I do see some other employers who are, you know, really stating a case that they will um, want people back in the office. I, I, to be honest, I don't, apart from some of the Americans, when a lot of organisations in my experience talk about getting people back into the office, they mean three days a week. They're not meaning they want to get them back in five days, but yet they're still struggling to do that three days in some cases for some people. Um, and I have seen there's a law firm, um, I saw an article about a law firm recently who said, you know, to be eligible for bonuses, you have to be in the office for three days. Um, so, you know, there are some levers being pulled and, and yeah, definitely as the job market changes and there are more candidates available, obviously employers can then set their terms in a, in a, in a, in a, you know, in a more um, advantageous way to them.
Hi, thank you. Great panel. Um, I just wanted to kind of, it's not dissimilar to the previous question. I just wanted to ask if any of you'd had experience of organisations that don't care, that aren't flexible, that do dictate the terms and they do lose people, but that's fine because they get them replaced and they don't care about diversity. And, you know, what have you experienced of that? And what do you say to them? And how do you point to them? The, the impact that it has on their business when quite frankly they don't care they don't it ain't broke so we don't need to fix it so I'd maybe just kick that off so there's there's clearly in financial services there have been a few headline firms of people who's, who are saying this and 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 maybe it's done through naivety and um, there was an article I think it was in June, Fortune magazine, and it ran something like ultra high, ultra rich, ultra ultra rich couples are living like it's the 1950s. I don't know if any of you read that, but what went by ultra rich? They actually what they were meaning is probably many people in this room, you know, people where they where they had the cutoff point. It was, it was basically if you've been really successful in financial services, you were classed as high net as, as this sort of ultra ultra rich. And what the demographic was showing is that they were, I can't remember, it was like 25% more of them, the general population, had stay-at-home wives. And I think what's interesting about that is how that impacts on hybrid working. Because if you think these people are senior men, by and large, who have a stay-at-home wife in financial services industry, and they have not experienced personally the value to their family unit of hybrid working, because they've got a wife at home who does all the childcare stuff, who is there to, you know, when they, when little Johnny breaks, you know, breaks their leg and you have to take them to A and E, all that kind of, or to do the drop off and be able to be there for the school assembly, all these kind of little things. Uh, when the when the delivery comes, you don't have to take time off work. And the issue is that these people are setting the hybrid working policy, and they haven't experienced for themselves firsthand the benefit of that. So I think I'd like to think that to some extent it's ignorance rather than complete and and that by again shining a light and being upfront being aware it's like the proximity bias being aware of this bias that you have if you are in this kind of like 1950s type arrangement how that can affect your hiring policies and really affect the sort of people that you that you're able to to attract so i think more publicity about this kind of stuff helps to make the problem visible and and that helps to call out the problem so that you understand whether it is complicity or whether it's ignorance. And if it's ignorance, it can be educated. Finish on a slightly more optimistic note. Um, I mean, I, I, I guess what we see is that organisations are, are full of people. And, you know, even if an organisational ethos might be very traditional might be concerned there will be people working within there who are trying to make change um, and I think that is the encouraging bit which is if people make change and if they demonstrate that, that actually within their team this can work whatever form of flexibility that creates role models and other people notice it and change can happen sort of inside out um, so yes, a bit of bit of a note, note of hope there, I think, and it's not, you know, I think he, even in the most traditional organisations, we do see there are people who are trying to make changes. Thank you very much, uh, and thank you for your questions. That was fantastic. So we've heard about the views on presenteeism, uh, how best to manage a hybrid team, understanding where people want to work. Um, and supporting those different stages of people's careers as well, and offering flexible options for people working and wanting to return to work. So I think in terms of a call to action, uh, and one thing for you to take away from this session, is our ultimate aim is to improve how hybrid working is done and, it is, and to ensure that it is truly inclusive. So thank you so much to Jenny, to Dominique, Charlene, and uh, Julianne for joining me on this panel today. I'm going to hand over to the next panel, uh, Devia Sharma, who is going to lead on Flex, the Forgotten Element of Smart Working. <laughs>